Please remain standing as you hear today's gospel lesson. The lesson today are Jesus' words contained in Matthew's gospel, the fifth chapter, the 16th verse. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they may see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know if it's my age or if it's the times that we live in, but I find myself more and more reflecting back on the way things were when I was a young child. And I look at my almost two-year-old grandson, Joey. I was privileged to spend time with him almost the entire day on Friday. And I thought, how do we instill good Christian values in this little boy? You know, they call it the terrible twos because they're all in that me, me, me stage. And he throws little temper tantrums if he doesn't get what he wants. So maybe that's what spurred my thinking. But I thought, how do we instill good values in children today? We want to teach them good values, and we want to be sure that we do not teach them some other values. For instance, I do not want him to pick up and learn and possess the value that is important to win at any cost. And yet, when I look at the world around me, that is a value that I see proclaimed by many businesses. That is a value that I see touted and projected to us in multitude of ways through our political system. Enough said about that, right? To win at any cost is a value that I do not want little Joey to pick up and embody in his life. I want him to embody the values that I learned as a child from my parents and from going to Sunday school and vacation Bible school and from watching wholesome shows like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood that some of you talked about this past week in our book discussion club. Valuing the importance of helping others. You know, whenever we baptize a young child in this congregation, we as a congregation make a pledge to that child. We say that we will surround that child with steadfast love so that they may be, be what? Established in the faith. Established in the faith. My friends, that's an active word to establish our children in the faith means we help them to take on those values, those values that are godly, those values that Jesus possessed, those values that Jesus taught about. I think about Vacation Bible School, those five days that almost 40 children gathered together in Threat Hall just a few weeks ago, and how... Every single day of Vacation Bible School this year, we talk to them about the importance of shining Jesus' light in this world. That's a value that I want them to hold on to. And it's a value that I just heard Taylor sing about. A value. A value of shining with Jesus' light. And yet so often when I think about that song, I have this image of myself as a little girl and of little children standing in front of a church sanctuary, holding up their little finger, all cute, waving the finger back and forth and singing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Is that what y'all think of when y'all hear that song? Cute little children holding their fingers up, waving it in the air. 
But my friends, that song is not about cuteness. That song is about the kingdom strategy that Jesus gives to us. It's about the strategy for making this world more like the kingdom of God that we pray about when we pray the Lord's Prayer. It's the words that Jesus used in the scripture that I just read for us today. Let your light shine so that others may know where that light comes from. Let your light shine. Those words are contained in what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Many of us have heard that phrase, the Sermon on the Mount, but it's contained in Matthew's Gospel, the first Gospel in the New Testament portion of our Bibles, in chapters 5, 6, and 7. And you just heard me say that verse comes in chapter 5, so it's right there at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And it kind of summarizes what Jesus is telling us to do. Now, the first few verses of the Sermon on the Mount are known as the Beatitudes. And these are the attitudes that our light is supposed to shine. These are the values that we're supposed to hold on to in life. These are the values that we are supposed to establish in our lives and in our children's lives. Where Jesus says, Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are you when others speak all manner of evil against you. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. My friends, that's about our works of justice and mercy in this world. Some people fuss at churches for getting involved in social justice issues. But Jesus is telling us we're supposed to be peacemakers. And we might get persecuted for standing up for righteousness in this world, but we are supposed to go out and shine with that light to work for righteousness and justice and to be peacemakers and merciful and humble in that work that we do. These are the ways that we are to shine that light So far from being a cute little sentimental song about shining our light, that song is to remind us of this scripture, that we are to be kingdom builders. It is Jesus' strategy for changing this world into the world that God intends for it to be. Now this is even more remarkable for us to be told that we are to be the lights in this world, shining that light, when we remember that Jesus himself says that he is the light of the world. And there are many scripture passages that tell us that Jesus is the light. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, this prophecy is told about Jesus' birth. We are told that a light will come into the world. Jesus is called the light unto the Gentiles. And in the Gospel of John, we are told told that Jesus is the light and that the darkness can never overcome him. And Jesus is saying to us in this Sermon on the Mount that yes, I am the light, but once I ascend and go to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, you are to be the light. Which means, you're to do what I did. You're to shine the light the way I shined the light. Jesus touched people with love and mercy and compassion and grace and healing and forgiveness. And we are to do the same thing. Wherever we see pain and hurt in this world, we are to shine the light of love and compassion and mercy and grace and forgiveness helping to bring healing and hope back into this world. What Jesus is talking about, my friends, is that we now possess those redemptive powers to bring healing and hope into this world. Now, I know some of you may sit back and go, I don't know, I'm not very powerful myself. I don't think I have very much to offer 
to bring hope and healing into the world? What can I do? Well, my friends, if you've ever been in a place of deep, deep darkness yourself, loneliness, grief, feeling overwhelmed by regret about things in your past, feeling discouraged or feeling like you don't belong, you know what small acts of kindness and grace can do to bring light and hope back into your world. Think about what a small phone call can do for you. What a note in the mailbox or a card from a friend can do for you. What a text message from someone can do to give you a glimmer of hope that someone notices you, that someone remembers you, that someone was thinking about you, that you're not really all alone, that what we just read in the scripture in our affirmation of faith when we said we are not alone in this world, just one person reaching out to you in that dark time can remind you that you are not alone. It's a glimmer of the light shining back into your life. Robert Smith wrote a little story years ago about how the mystery of this little light touched his heart in a way that was so powerful that he would never forget it and he wanted to spend his life remembering that he needed to always shine with the light of Christ. He says, it's been 40 years since I saw her, but in my memory she's still, still there with me every Christmas season especially. I feel her presence especially whenever I receive a Christmas card you see, I was 12 years old on that Christmas. And Christmas was only two days away. When Mama came home from the grocery store, snow was gently falling, and I was getting excited about Christmas and about getting to go out and play with my friends in the snow. So I dressed hurriedly, but I knew what I had to do first. Before I could build that snowman or slide down the hill or throw snowballs with my friends, I had to help Mama unload the family station wagon. As far back as I could remember, I helped Mama unload the family station wagon with those groceries. And Mama always had a special task for me. She'd hand me one bag sometimes two bags of groceries, and she'd say, all right, son, you need to deliver these over to Mrs. Hilbrent. Mrs. Hilbrent was our 95-year-old neighbor. She was bent over with arthritis and couldn't walk very well except with her cane. She walked very slowly, and she couldn't get out of the house very often. So Mama always did her grocery shopping. And I would take the groceries over there to her house and help her put them up in her cupboard. And she would always give me a dime for helping her out. It had been a long time since I really told her, oh, no, don't give it to me. Because I knew she'd always press me and say, oh, no, you got to take the dime. And I would take that dime and I'd go down the street to the little store and I'd buy myself some candy or bubble gum or something every single time. Well, on this day, I knew that one of the things that she loved to do whenever I entered her house and helped her put up the groceries was she loved to talk to me about the olden days and about what life was like when she was a little girl. I usually enjoyed it, but on this particular day, I really did not want to get into a long conversation with her because I wanted to get out and play in that snow. But as I went over there, knocked on her door, I heard her slowly shuffle across the floor. And I heard that thud, thud, thud of her cane. 
Then I heard that jingle of the chain unlatching in the door. She cracked the door open, and then she opened it wide and gave me a big grin. I came in and I put the groceries on the table in the kitchen, and she sat down and she started to unpack them and hand them to me and tell me where they needed to go. Well, as I did, I realized how lonely she was. And so I let her tell me the story about Christmas when she was a little child. We laughed, we smiled. And she asked me if I wanted a cup of tea, which is what she always did when I went over there. I knew if I had that cup of tea, I'd be there a long time. But she was lonely. So I said, sure. Before I knew it, an hour had passed. She looked over at me and she said, oh my goodness, look at the time. I bet you want to go out and play in the snow with your friends. I better let you go. And I headed towards the door. I didn't want her to give me that dime. And she said, wait, 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 wait. And I said, oh no, no, you don't need to give me anything. And she said, now, what would Christmas be if you can't give something nice to people that you love? And she reached in her pocket and dug around. And this time she pulled out a quarter and handed to me. Oh, no, 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 that's too much. No, you take it. And remember that I love you. Well, I took that quarter across the street, down the road to that little store, and I thought, goodness, a quarter, what can I buy? A comic book, lots of candy, what do I want? And as I walked in the store, I saw a display of Christmas cards. And one particular Christmas card caught my eye. It was a Christmas card of a little church. A little church out in the country, like the little church that she told me she grew up in. And I knew I had to buy it. So I went to the clerk and I bought that card with her quarter. And I asked for a pen to borrow so that I could sign it in a hurry. And the clerk looked at me and he said, you got a card for your girlfriend? And I started to say no. But then I thought about it and I said, well, yeah, kind of. I put it in the envelope and I went back over to her house and I knocked on the door and I handed her that Christmas card. She looked at it. She read it, and she smiled and said, Thank you. Merry Christmas. And I said, Merry Christmas to you, and went on to play with my friends. Well, a few days later, I saw an ambulance in front of her house. She had passed away in her sleep. And right beside her bed, her little lamp light was still on, illuminating a single Christmas card with a picture of a little church on it. I think about that Christmas card every Christmas. On a cold, wintry afternoon, that Christmas card brought light into an old lady's heart and home. Light that helped her to know that she too was loved by Christ. Some people call it oxytocin that warms your heart. But I call it the light and the love of Jesus. We need to shine with Jesus' light, my friends, because this world is filled with dark and scary times. The economies of powerful countries are in trouble. The empty and dark interiors of many people's wallets are on shaky ground. The temperatures keep rising because our earth is very fragile 
and groaning, groaning for healing. There are many people who are feeling hopeless and helpless in our world today and displaced as our denomination starts to break up. And the dark dreariness of everyday survival makes some people want to just band together and find their tribe and wait until the darkness ends. But my friends, when we receive the light of Christ, it's not supposed to go into some deep, dark hole inside of us that we keep for ourselves. We're supposed to shine it out for the world to see. We're supposed to let others know where that light comes from and share it with the world. You remember that old, old story about the church in Germany after World War II when some American soldiers were cleaning up that large cathedral that had been hit by a bomb. They found and gathered together fragments of the statues and put them in a pile. And among those fragments that they found was a statue of Jesus. And that statue of Jesus was completely intact except for the hands. And so one of those American soldiers placed it right up at the front of the church and he wrote a sign below it. And the sign below it said simply this, You are my hands. My friends, we are not only the hands of Christ. We are the light of Christ to do whatever we can, wherever we see hurt, we are to shine with Jesus' light. That is how my little Joey and all of the other children and all of the people that we encounter will take on the values of Jesus. When they see them active and making a difference in this world, May we have the faith and the courage to so live. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.